an historic weekend for Ipswich Town Football Club on and off the field this weekend. Join us as we try and make sense of all of it here on the Blue Monday podcast. <laughs> Hello and welcome to the Blue Monday podcast discussing the town up or down. Since 2015, I'm Rich Woodard and welcome to the flagship show brought to you in partnership with our friends at Innovation Labs. We go live every Sunday at 8pm on YouTube to talk all things Ipswich Town, but if you prefer, you can watch and listen on demand afterwards. Joining me to talk through all of this unprecedented news, Dave Diamond, Joe Fairs. Joe, we'll start with you. Um, because we want to talk ITFC women off the top and then we're going to try and make sense of all of this financial stuff that is far too clever for me, which is why you guys are here and I'm not in the part- I'm in the contributor seat. But Joe, you were at Wembley yesterday, weren't you? Um, 80,000 no. odd other people and feeling any better about the Euros now? Um, it's a difficult one because you're missing a few players and it wasn't, it wasn't the greatest game, truth be told. It was a little bit, i say you miss Harry Kane. Your four first choice fullbacks muster 12 minutes between them with those missing, and it just sort of fell apart a little bit. But it was a decent test. I think I'm, I'm hopeful Southgate learned a few things. I'm still positive going into the Euros. I, f- I think it's sort of us or France are the best teams, and one of us will win the trophy. But it's just trying to get the right side of the draw, trying to get a bit of luck as and when you need it. But no, we're a good side. It's just making sure you get your best players fit and out on the pitch in the summer, isn't it? It's no different to any other kind of game of football. Get your best 11 out there. A, an enjoyable trip down to Wembley as well, Joe? Yeah, yeah. Headed down early. Took the boys. So Teddy'd been there before, but my youngest, it was his first time there. So with them, oh, so wow. we managed nice. to get down there. Get down there early and just go around the mall, have a bit of oh, the outlet mall, they call it there, isn't it? And ha- have a bit of dinner and head in. And no, it's a really good, really good experience. We were sort of in the, I think we were in like the singers part of the ground though. So okay. it didn't mean that they had to, stand on their chair for the whole game and with a seven o'clock kickoff probably was a little bit a little bit much for them by the end of it but they were asleep before we'd almost got out of Wembley driving home so <laughs> I at least I got some peace and quiet on the way home <laughs> nice stuff well talking to people who a didn't get any peace and quiet yesterday afternoon and b were in the singing section David Diamond do you want to talk to us about your Saturday afternoon yeah, I mean it was it was good. Obviously, it was the first um, the first ITFC ladies game at um, at Portman Road um, against against <clears throat> against Chatham. Um, it, well, I say incredibly superb, superb over ten thousand. I think just a shade over ten thousand tickets tickets sold. Um, and yeah, the drummers and the uh, the hardcore of the uh, of the a- AGL um, Felix Dove support were there in the, obviously were there in force yesterday. And um, yeah, I've got to say, I've, you know, I've, I've been down to Felix Dove several times, go several times a season. But yeah, really, really enjoyable, uh, enjoyable afternoon. Brilliant, brilliant for the brilliant for the ladies, brilliant for the club, really. And also crikey for Chatham as well. How good was yeah. that when they found when they found that one out? So. Uh, yeah, all all good, and it was the full. I mean, we got there. What well, we got there about half an hour before, didn't we, Rich? And it was the full match day experience for them, really, wasn't it? Brilliant. It was mm. uh, faithless on the way out, and yeah, everything in between. So yeah, um, c- uh, congratulations to the club. Yeah, um, put a lot of effort in, and that gate, Dave. That, I mean, we we talked about the significance of 10,000 in the isolation of what it means for the women's team. But I don't think apart from maybe England and two other games in the I think I read that. yesterday, in and the I think probably West Ham and another WSL championship teams played today wouldn't have beaten that 10,000 gate. So in the grand scheme of things, that number is just immense, but well, we'll talk not, about kind of what it means. Rich, not, I mean, not only that, you don't really have to go back that many seasons where it wasn't, <laughs> you know what I'm going to say there it wasn't well, yeah. many more than that for a um, for a, a first team men's game so um yeah to be everyone to be applauded I think maybe more about that later on we um just wanted to jump in the comments we are live so we will come to the comments get your thoughts questions on uh, ITFC women um investment um and anything else uh, plenty of time to go through Q&A um but Romeo hi all my first ITFC women's game yesterday impressive performance by town enjoyed it uh, Rob really enjoyed it yesterday more importantly it's motivated his daughter who only wants to wear blue and white uh, love that stuff and um yeah 
Um, Colin was there as well, saw the ITC, ITC flag behind the goal. Uh, that was at Wembley, presumably, but there's lots of flags at Portman Road yesterday as well. Um, Streaky, um, who won our ticket giveaway. Cracking day at Portman Road yesterday. Thank you to the BM team for the tickets. I mean, in terms of uh, the match action, Dave, we'll quickly just deal with that. I mean, two bits of team news that are, are kind of interesting and relevant for, for us, certainly. Lucy O'Brien, we talked to her midweek. She got a start. And I guess good news for um, friends of the podcast, as it were. Um, and Eloise King made her first, um, I think she was named in the squad for the first time this season, but even better than that, Dave. Yeah, it was superb, wasn't it? Um, Chris and Tracy are parents a long time, obviously, you know, pod pod listeners and pod supporters. And um, yeah, they've sort of, they've, yeah, when she's been out the side, which has been pretty much all this season, they've been there supporting, haven't they? And uh, yeah, they were there yesterday. It was quite funny because it got to like, I think, only really noticed her warming up from about 75 minutes onwards, perhaps. Perhaps she did before, didn't see it. And you could see, oh, has she, they were looking over, has she got the call? We all were, really. Has she got the call? Has she got the call? And once it was a sort of false alarm, she went back and sat down. But yeah, got on the pitch, I think, 85th minute. So absolutely brilliant for, for them all, really. And you see what it meant to them at the end, to the whole family at the end. That was a sort of really nice moment, wasn't it? It was, yeah. And got to do a fist pump as well. We know that like Harry Clark, she's kind of passed, uh, taken the mantle off from Luke Chambers. And the goals, Dave, really tidy, weren't they? Two at our end, sadly three at the opposite end. But um, really, of course, no one, else, no one else was going to score the first one apart from Natasha Thomas. No, no that, was a good, that was a good goal, wasn't it? Um, sort of she cuts in a bit on a, um, a sort of wide sort of left at a penalty. Yeah, a really good finish, actually. You, sort of whip, you think the chance is almost gone or it's almost going to lead to a cross and you sort of, Hammers one in the near post and roof of the net off the near post. Um, and as expected, I think the the ladies sort of pretty much dominated dominated possession really. Had a couple of had a couple of useful front players, didn't they? Mm. Um Charles was it, I think, was 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 one of them. Really, really good. Um so what was it, three nil at half time? They hit the bar just before half time, which would have made it would have made it interesting. I mean the other two. Second goal was an interesting goal. Um Sophie Peskett, wasn't it, who came off the who came off the right, and it was basically when we got there watching them warm up. That was that was basically she must have done that four or five times. Carbon copy shot across the keeper in the warm up from that, you know, just inside the box as well. So that was a pleasing finish. But um, I haven't seen it back, and it was the other end from us on Town in five. But the fourth goal was a bit special, wasn't it? Where Tidy. the left back Summer Hughes on that. Well, Joe pointed out how he, he watched it back. It, it starts with uh, one of the centre halves playing it out and. Summer well, Hughes. It's, it's the keeper whatever. first, isn't it? Playing the flat yeah, key roll on the halfway line, isn't it? It's a typical town goal. Um, Summer Hughes, the left back, who I think is one of our, whenever I've seen the plays, always very consistent. Just a great little player. Comes in off the off the, off the the left. Um, sort of drives into the box. It's a lovely touch by Natasha Thomas, I think, isn't it? Yeah. And then Gunning Williams. And then Gunning Williams, the right foot sort of curling finish. It was, it was a really, really... Really, really nice goal. And then Summer Hughes to, got the fifth to sort of cap it all off. So I think, yeah, um, a comfortable enough win. I know it was several people in the pub beforehand sort of predicting four or five nil. Um, that's good for chat and they weren't totally blown away, you know, which, you know, possession wise on the day and one or two chances. Their keeper had a half decent game, I thought, as well, didn't she? She did, mm -hmm. she did really well. So, um, but um, I've just seen them. Um, one or two comments about the best player. I thought Robertson. Is it Kira? Kira Robertson in Kyra, Kira Robertson yeah. in midfield. Well, Daniel says it. Really enjoyable day. A tremendous day for the club as a whole. Oh, sorry, Kyra, Kyra Robertson. Yeah, no, no, no. no, no. I was, it's, it's part. It's perfect timing from Daniel. Um, Kyra Robertson, class above Sam Morsey. Esque she performance. Was you agree with that? Absolutely superb yesterday. Ball carrying, winning the ball carrying. Very, very. He's, he's right. Morsey esque. Absolutely right. But um, no, what a great. Um, what a great, just a great, enjoyable, enjoyable day all round, really. Yeah, I don't know why my camera's gone all weird, but we'll continue nevertheless. I've got a kind of a weird glow about me, but that's probably because I've been drumming and singing and having all kinds of fun at Portman Road yesterday. And just, so. just, just going back, did, did one of you say that Natasha Thomas scored two yesterday? She's nearing 150? Yeah, 150 is coming close. So she's already surpassed the 200 appearances. 
Um, only the third player to do that. I think we talked about that on the pod a few weeks back, but now is, um, yeah, near. I think she's two off now, 150 wow. goals for the club. So fantastic stuff. And mm-hmm. yeah, everyone put in fantastic performances. Everyone, I think, enjoyed themselves. Good to see some men's staff. Um, JG putting here, Martin Pert on the pitch pre-match supporting Joe and uh, Sharon also echoing support for Joe just, as well. I think so. just quickly, I'll mention, I, and I didn't catch her name, oh, you may have done a bit of a shout out. I didn't quite realise for the chat and player because she went down in the first 10 minutes and apparently really bad um cut to a cut to a head we couldn't see it obviously where where we were from but she whether it was a sort of con- uh, she went off with a con- obviously she did yeah with lucy actually yeah yeah she did so um yeah apparently she had to um i think i read somewhere she had to go to hospital with that so um yeah, yeah. hope all okay there yeah we wish her well. i think her first name lenny but i can't remember her surname no, but yeah, sorry we wish i, I should have checked yeah um, terrible yeah but yeah, um, Romeo, you could see McKenna Stamp all over the performance. Definite parallels with the men's team stylistically. I mean, g- noting where we're going to next, Joe, I mean, in terms of the style of play, the identity, um, it was very much in evidence at Port Monod on Saturday. But that culture it seems like pervades every team, including the academy guys as well. We have a standard way of playing, a pattern to what we do, and it's consistent, isn't it? And it's, and it's also working too. Yeah, and I'm, and I'm sure the sort of women's team were happy to be playing on the sort of carpet at Portman Road yesterday because I've been down to the AGL a couple of times this season and they're trying to play out from the back and it's really, it can be really difficult and sort of to give them their dues, they do persist with it and the keepers try and play out there and sometimes it might lead to a mistake, but they're they're trying to do the right things and keep keep doing the right things there. So it's really positive when you see sort of a team of an average age of 20, I think it was 20 years and four months old and they're really pushing. So you're just hoping to, hoping that they can keep progressing, hopefully that they can get onto a pitch with sort of a better surface more consistently so that they can show off their football as evidenced by the fourth goal yesterday with a sort of lovely sort of back here by Natasha Thomas at the end of the great finish. Yeah, who may or may not be here. I'm pretty, well, thank you for the Blue Army anyway, whoever you are. If it is Natasha Thomas, then um, brilliant, but I'm maybe not a nice, a good alias and a homage to the <laughs> goat, as we call her at the AGL. Um, let's move things forwards um, and talk about takeover stuff. I've got, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do the basics because I'm basic and simple. Um, So I'm going to lay out some bits and pieces and then essentially bring your questions folks, um, because we want to make sense of this. I think we'll go, we'll start with Joe and kind of get Joe's take on things, but let me just explain what's happened first. Um, Let's start with this one. So apologies covering everyone's faces up for now. Um, So Bright Passports Partners, a US-based private equity firm, have invested £105 million in the club, securing them a 40% stake. They'll be represented by co-founders Jake Zano and Philip Ciano, um, and their investment also comprised several limited partners, and I'm sure that means something for accountants out there, but I suspect it means they put money in but don't have a huge amount of say, of which Sam Simon, the founder of Simon Group Holdings and Simon Sports, is the primary funder. ORG, headed by Ed Schwartz, who we all know, remains the majority and controlling shareholder in the club with their circa 50% holding. The remaining 10 is made up of smaller investors, including the three Lions. And then finally, in terms of how things work and who's doing what, so CEO Mark Ashton continues to manage day-to-day running of the club. Ed Schwartz, and I think to a lot of our Telegram members, a lot of reassurance provided by Chairman Mike O'Leary, continuing in his role as, along with Chief Financial Officer Tom Ball. They continue as board members of Game Changer and the football club. Bright Passports will provide capital and strategic thinking, which will be of significant benefits to the club, quote, um, the, their new investment sees changes at board level. They, this includes Sam Simon and Jake Zano join, uh, joining the board of Game Changer, as does uh, Mark Ashton as well. And Chief Operating Officer Luke Warren will join the boards of both Game Changer and the football club. So we've dealt with the facts, a few figures, a few changes to personnel. I guess first and foremost, Joe, um, give me your overriding emotions and thoughts around the announcement as and when it broke on Friday. Um, I think the for, for me, if you just try and keep it simple, and I know there's a lot going on behind the scenes. So the first thing is the little bit of reticence, like you get sort of US private equity money into the club, which is generally, well, we've got US money in the club. It's like a pension fund, which is long-term returns. We know the people that have put that in now, but we didn't at the time it came in. 
And now you've got this little private equity that is probably going to be wanting a quicker return on their money would probably be true to say. But then on the flip side, for me, just looking at it as a fan, which sometimes you just want to be, they're talking about going to a Category 1 Academy, which is something I've wanted from the very start, which is fantastic news. They're talking about, I think they basically say four to five years. Effectively, we've got the capital to run ourselves for the next four to five years. So effectively, in the last two seasons, Game Changer have bought some more shares. They're put in. Fifteen million pounds to keep with the running costs and those sort of figures, and now we've basically got this money. I'm sure it's not just sitting there in an account for us to dip into it as we want, but we've got agreements to take parts of that money as and when we need them. We know there's a training ground project going, sort of about to be announced or has been announced, but maybe not the details yet. Maybe when you watch the video on Town TV, you see the players being presented about the training ground and the full details on that. So, yeah, on on that side of it, it's just really positive. The training ground is going to be a state-of-the-art training ground sort of when you look at what Mark Ashton did at Bristol City previously when you look at some of the other ones about there you've got that you've got the academy going up and you've you know we've got no funding issues for the next four to five years as opposed to it's sort of like a business isn't it cash flow versus solvency we've got the cash flow in place now which yeah. which is great so yeah and I'd say to sort of link back to the women's team as well previously. Well, if if we're building this training ground, this facility, and we're going to Cat 1, there's going to need to be a show pitch there, which will have seating, which will have capacity there, which will be a perfect pitch like we've we've wanted. And maybe that could be a new home for them as a, in, in addition to sort of the under-21s team and the under-18s team for the bigger games. And yeah, we're just, everything at the moment is pointing us back to where we want to be as a club, which is, back at the sort of in the Premier League effectively and maybe a Premier League or a parachute team and somewhere in that range and I like say you've you've got all that stuff sorted and it's it really exciting news on that side of it. Yeah Dave I, w- I wanted to see whether your thoughts chime with that as well. Mark here saying so exciting to be an Ipswich fan. Uh, Trevor thank he- <laughs> thank heavens Marcus Evans sold up. I mean he's still involved I think sold a, mm-hmm. the majority stake didn't he but still I think one of those minority shareholders that comprise the 10% ownership that I was talking about. I mean worth rewinding because we always talk about this rapid progression certainly on the field but off the field you rewind three years this time three years ago there was stuff in the background that maybe some folk were aware of, but we, most of us weren't. And the, we just lost actually to Portsmouth 2-1, Paul Cook versus Danny Cowley. I think Marcus Harness might have scored the winner in that game. And things looked very hopeless at that point, didn't they? And you fast forward three years, obviously we are, uh, you know, three years-ish into the Game Changer era. And now even more capital has been injected. Um, I mean, very simply, this feels... Like I'm um, just crazy times for this football club, isn't it? It just feels like we're, we're sort of with the last we've been in a parallel universe, really, doesn't it? Because we were, we were honestly. Is this a COVID side effect or something? Do you I know mean, what I mean? Did I did I read somewhere? I was reading somewhere yesterday about Bristol City being the most boring club yeah, in the yeah. um in in the EFL. Well, I'm, I'm, video, pretty, I, yeah. I'm pretty certain it was us, wasn't it? Really, was us literally. Um, three, well, certainly certainly four years ago, three four years ago, um. And it's just, it's just incredible the rate, the rate this has happened. I mean, everything's just, everything's just on the upside, isn't it? It is absolutely incredible. And it's, as Joe quite rightly said, you know, um, and Joe, we all have, haven't we? Been an advocate for Category One, you know, um, Category One um, Academy, and it's just brilliant that now that hopefully that will, that will, you know, be coming to, be coming to fruition now. Um, yeah. And it's important for attracting the right, obviously, for attracting the right. You know the right kids, the right the right players to come in. So, yeah, it's just such a transformation in just such a short. It is a relatively short space of time. No one could have foreseen this. I don't think. Not really. No. Uh, I mean, in terms oh, it's, of God, it's, 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 a, it's a lot more pressure as well, though, isn't it? That's, that's it yeah. is. It comes for me that. in, in yeah. that like when when you look at the um, sort of the investment that we've had from sort of Game Changer Twenty previously and the deal that's in place effectively they'd bought the club for 40 million or 30 40 million they'd spent probably the same again on it and we knew it was worth a lot more than that at the moment but i don't think we expected it to be worth i know it says the figure is up to 105 million for 40 percent. so mm. how that works to, is that reliant on promotion we don't know but we, we we now know that the sort of game changer guys rather than just sit on their hands and oh we've made money on this so far and we can keep pushing it at our pace now we've effectively tried to bring someone in to bring the rocket boosters to 
to keep pushing on with that and does obviously that means that there is more pressure on getting things right now isn't there we aren't going to be able to just oh we'll turn into like you say Bristol City or Preston North End in the championship now are we we are going to have to keep pushing for promotion and we're going to have to make sure Kieran McKenna stays at Portman <laughs> Road and I'm sure he'd have been all around this and we have to we have to trust Mark Ashton and the got and the ownership group because they've done everything they said they would so far and they're still retaining overall control and it's 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 still Mark Ashton who's getting the business plan sorted and yeah in agreement with those I guys think, and he's sort of done a faultless job so far. Yeah, I think that's most important and people mentioned you you alluded to it, Rich, didn't you, on the statement about Mike O'Leary, you know, people mm. on the Telegram group and mentioned him. Just a real steady, steady hand, steady hand on the on the sort of rudder, really, both of them, you know, are still going to be there um, running the show from day to day, which I think is is, is really important. Yeah, I mean, it's worth, I mean, uh, clearly we are, we are, we're here to give our views and opinions and we respect folk have got different views on this as well. You know, anytime there's a change to something that people love and hold dear, there's always a little bit of concern as well. And obviously in finance and investment, there is always risk. There are always companies that are motivated in different ways. And so a few of the folk, and I'll, I'll give them the courtesy of putting these views out there. Um, Paul, uh, Paul states, you know, private equity firms don't always have the best of reputations generally. Um, it seems like Bright Path are um, certainly minority shareholders. Um, and it seems like Joe not necessarily having a strong stake, but the club are, are clearly dependent on them in terms of capital. And it seems that there's a, there's some strategic alignment there as well. It's worth noting that Sam Sports, um, Simon Sports, sorry, um, uh, I've got Fireside, which is a streaming community platform. Um, they've got an interest in, they might own, in fact, the Halifax Mooseheads, uh, hockey news website, um, golf, mind and body training app. I mean, there is expertise they're bringing to the table, but as we've kind of alluded to, you don't invest for free or to be nice, do you? No, and that, that's this is where the money is, and it? it is private equity, and it is dog eat dog, and it is ruthless, and we are going to need to make returns on what we say we are going to do, and that they're in this to make money and they might think they've got expertise, but really they're money providers at the moment, aren't they? And if we need their expertise, we might, we might try and find it, but it's a, uh, yeah, it's, it's going to be an interesting, an interesting turn, isn't it? And as with anything, you can't, we, we were all mega excited about the takeover and I think we were right to be there. And now it's just a case of, well, you, you've got to trust the guys in place, but yeah, you don't really want to get on the wrong side of, private equity and giving giving bigger stakes up but i say you've got you've got to trust the guys that have put you there so far because they've done everything right up up to this point it's yeah. crazy and, isn't it? and just as a plug for the telegram group there's been some brilliant chat on this yes. in there mm, a few guys really. in the comments nick in the comments yeah. um, who's, who's in it tonight has been really informative on that and there's been some real good back and forth and then a real attempt to understand it and the the video from the club is excellent but yeah we've sort of seemed to as a community and they've been able to really sort of get some, get some real clarity on answers in there without no one saying this is exactly what's going to happen it's all just discussion around it yeah it was i was thought it was really interesting i i kind of skipped to the end of the video a little bit on friday cuz Joe was threatening to take us all live, folks, and I was like, "I'm not, I'm not ready, I'm not ready to do it." Um, but it, I was, I found it really interesting that Mark Ashton said um, that uh, we've been really transparent and open about this, and obviously, 45 minute interview on Telegram, um, um, Town TV, because we know that we know that our supporters are very, you know, forensic and drill into the detail and got access to companies' house and all that kind of stuff. So they obviously know that we're, uh, yeah, we're not, you know. We know what do it we're doing, and I would yeah, I'd definitely advocate Joe's um advert for Telegram. The pie charts were on by this afternoon, weren't they, guys? When you when the pie charts hand, are getting hand drawn, drawn pie charts, you know. Yeah. Joe, you um, Joe, Joe just wanted to go live Friday to get his Uncle Sam outfit back on. <laughs> that's right. That's what he's really after. That's what he's really after. I mean, what I was going to say is, I mean, these people four to five, four to five years, four to five seasons to to return. I mean, if we if we maintain that current trajectory, I'd be champions of the league by then. <laughs> he's, he's got there it. He's it still got it. Oh, for, there for, it is. There for, we for go. those listening on podcast, <laughs> Joe Fairs has got his there barbecue bib out. Is it a bib or a, a bit of a? It was from, I think, isn't it? It was from like the Big Easy or somewhere like that, where you're eating a messy dinner. 
lobster or yeah, I'll have to whatever. dig out with it. I'll, I'll have to create a playlist of all of our takeover um, videos and live reactions. Who'd have thought that this podcast would talk about any off field stuff? But here we are uh, covering all of that stuff. Um, do get your questions and thoughts in. We've got plenty of time for those. Um, if you want to talk ITFC women, if you want to talk um, Bright Path um, or anything else, obviously it's, it's a break in terms of the men's action, but we are coming back on Friday with Blackburn. Um, there are players in international duty and think. Jeremy Sarmiento might be playing as we record um, against Italy, I think, for Ecuador. Um, and then obviously the uh, Kiefer and uh, Kiefer Moore and Nathan Broadhead, I think, in action on Tuesday night. Uh, is it a playoff for them against Poland? Yeah, it's the, it's the actual playoff now. Yeah. So they had semi. So in this international break, there's three, well, there's three sets, but there's three semis and three finals or six semis and three yeah, finals. So proper. in their path, they've, they beat Estonia, was it on, or Finland, they beat on Thursday night, and then they played Poland on Tuesday night. Both both of those games were at the Cardiff City Stadium. Kiefer Moore was a sub, and Nathan Broadhead was a very late sub in the first leg, so we'll see how they line up for this one, but a big opportunity for Wales to get to the Euros. Yes. Just quickly, just quickly, I'm talking about international football, did you see the six-second goal from Denmark? <laughs> Not yet. It was in <laughs> Austria, was it? Was, oh, was that Aust- sorry? Was that Austria? Yeah, oh, I, Austria, I haven't actually seen it yet, Sorry, well, you're right. It was Austria. Boom, boom, got, and it was Austria. Yeah, six seconds from the kickoff. Ridiculous. There's something wrong. There's something, feel, something wrong about it. It feels like something we might do, doesn't it? I, you just don't to, be that team, do you? To link from that on, on the Wales game, a few people have noted in the comments about mm. um, West Burns' Instagram post. It looks like it's, it's obviously a little bit cryptic as people are. Mm. like to do on social media but it's basically saying a setback i'll be back effectively so i think if you were to make a guess of what that means it probably means his season is over there you and go. if it is really a real shame but it i think as soon as he pulled up that's what everyone's instant reaction was on that yeah, it was. Yeah. I mean, do, should we deal with that now? A few people have kind of mentioned it, as you said in the chat, and it kind of says, uh, you know, we all suffer big tests and I'll come back strong and all that kind of stuff. I guess the good thing is we've got um, Amari Hutchinson in form. Hopefully the injury to kind of chap and they kept him out of shift for Wednesday isn't too serious as well. But Dave, um, as always, like Caden Jackson is, if we can talk about I'll be back. Arnold Schwarzenegger impression. It's blooming Caden Jackson, isn't it? Well, we 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 said it, didn't we, on the pod last week? You know, I think, and and look, McKenna's like that. It very much, I think, be clearly. I think he's. Um, I think, as Joe said, he's it, possibly that means he's out for the rest of the season, and I think it'll be horses for courses. So some games, no doubt, it'll be no, some games, no doubt, it'll be Jackson. Other games, maybe if Chaplin's back, it'll be um, it'll be Hutchinson shunt. I say shunted outright, but Hutchinson playing outright. Well, only because he was so good. Only because he was so good last week. But yeah, so um, yeah, I mean, this could be a big, big few weeks for Caden Jackson. An unexpectedly big few weeks for Caden Jackson. Amazing, indeed. Yeah. Um, Talking about other wingers, Elliot is is keeping an eye on what's going on with uh, oh, Jeremy Sarmiento. It. Italy are 1-0 up. Sarmiento with three out of three accurate passes after 20 minutes, though. 6.3 rating, according to FootMob. Hashtag Telegram style analysis. That's what we want, Elliot. Keep the stats coming. We were keeping an eye on... Uh, I, was, I kind of checked into Ben's live stream for the England game last night. We were keeping a look on Paqueta's um, foul count, Joe. I think he was... It um, was ludicrous. <laughs> I, 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 I presume. Like, he had... <laughs> He had five fouls before he got booked, and then he just after that still just took Bellingham down from behind. <laughs> and the other guy, the Wolves, the Jao Gomez, he had five fouls about getting booked. The first half, it was just well, was pulling your hair Paquetta out. Belling, Bellingham got booked on. for his first first foul, didn't he? Yeah, yeah. Paqueta was quite lucky to stay on. Very, I, I, very. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But again, again, according to you know, as per Elliot's kind of point there, football had had him as their highest rate player. I think because he get a chance, didn't he? They're quite quite a few chances in the first half. I think he had one of them. So uh, we are going to, uh, we're going to hear from um, our partners at Innovation Labs, and then we're going to start answering some of your questions. So we'll be back shortly. If you want to get your question in, stick a cue at the start. It helps me because I said at the start, I'm a bit stupid just pressing buttons. So stick a cue at the start. That will help me in a question mark at the end. But here's some uh, information on our partners, Innovation Labs. Innovation Labs, providing co-working and innovation hubs across East Anglia. We're the perfect place for remote workers, freelancers, startups, or innovators to do business. Our unique member network creates extensive business development 
development and collaboration opportunities. Hot desks are available from £20 a day or £99 per month, with business coaching also available from £50. Innovation Labs, turning your ideas into multi-million pound businesses. Located in Stowmarket, Ipswich, Sudbury, with new sites in Thetford, Norwich and Kuala Lumpur, opening soon professionalism is and that's what you want and that's why mikey penny smith is on our voiceovers as well so you um thank you mikey and uh, if you're listening on the podcast you might just be able to make out craig fimbo talking about nordvpn uh we will sort that out it's a little bit quiet but um, nordvpn another partner we've got there's a link in the description whether you're watching or listening uh, get yourself a vpn and do lots of stuff with the internet um, but do it safely um courtesy of nordvpn 30 day money back guarantee um if you sign up with our link a uh, bit of a referral kickback for us but you get a discount too so everybody hopefully wins we'll do some more plugs about what shows we've got coming up uh later in the week we'll do that a bit later on um, let's do some questions. Lee, early doors asks, are there any more women's games planned for Portman Road this season? I'm happy to take this one. As it stands, I suspect not. There's only, I think, four home games left, I think, um, of this campaign. And a lot of effort obviously went into hosting on Saturday. It wouldn't surprise me if there's maybe a, we had a double header at AFC Wimbledon, didn't we, away with the men's and the women's team playing in pre-season. I wouldn't be surprised if, if that, is a thought that the club is having, but at the moment for this season, I think that's it. But Mark Ashton, as Joe mentioned at the start, um, definitely mentioned the plan is to do more. So a 10,000 gate makes that even more likely, but not probably this season. Lee. um, And also Nick, uh, really impressed with how town campaigned the women's game yesterday. What the club do next to engage with those who attended yesterday seems super important. Yeah. Big, isn't it Dave? Because you, you sat there at the AGL on a cold, Sunday afternoon in Felix, though, it'd be great if, you know, if, even if 1%, 10% of that, the new and crowd that think, went yesterday came along. Yeah, and you'd think there would be, you'd think there was sufficient interest there. And I've seen several comments in, our, you know, in the Telegram group where, you know, there were first time, um, you know, first time supporters there. So, yeah, you would think that that would spill over to, that would spill over to Felix, though. But, um, yeah, just, uh, yeah, one word of warning, whatever, whatever time of year it is, wear a big coat. That's all it's I'd a bit say. windy, isn't it? Yeah. It's, a bit, it's a bit windy off the North Sea at Felix, though, that's for sure. Yeah. And, and all... it's, a, it's a very different experience, isn't it? The women's game to the men's game uh, in the stadiums, and you see it with the uh, WSL games there. I think it's a much easier environment to take children to because it is just go there, watch the game, have a bit of a sing song, clap the goals, that sort of thing, as opposed to the real edge that can come, up, come into men's football at times where it can be nasty i'm like I say, i'm at the england game last night and i've got two kids with me there's people effing and blinding all around me at everything there and that is something you have to deal with which isn't so much in in that side of the game and we're in the which is a fantastic position at the moment of effectively you can't get tickets to the men's games at the moment can you that the home games are sold out and if every, every single game is sold out and you and you want children to be getting a look at it and you see on the Sort of town in five video at the end of the game the kids there were covered photos with sort of natasha thomas and maria boswell and people like that and they don't know any they don't i'm not saying they don't know any different but effectively they, they are watching an ipswich town team on portman road pitch there's ten thousand people there they're getting to have a selfie with the players afterwards and it's just massive for them to be able to do that isn't it so mm. really really key to move on to that and try and introduce people to a different part of ipswich town football club that may then lead them. That could be an entrance to the men's team support as well, rather yeah. than it being the men's introduction to the women's. It could, that can work both ways too. No, exactly. And, fair right. play, and also fair play to the girls yesterday. There was there were loads of them afterwards. Probably twenty minutes afterwards, still signing autographs and having selfies along in front of the Cobbold stand, wasn't there? Yeah. Uh, ITF women are away next weekend, by the way, at Rugby Borough. If you want to get involved in that, if you're local to the Midlands and want to head down there on Easter Sunday, uh, ITFC WSC, the Women's Official Sports Club, um, they arrange travel, but they'll have all the details you need. And obviously the club will tweet about tickets and access and all that kind of stuff. Back home on the 7th of April. I'm not sure there's a game in... Yeah, there won't be a game in between. So 7th of April at home to MK Dons. And I can guarantee you... Well, I can't guarantee you this because I might give the drum to someone else, but there'll be one, at least one less drum. So if the drum isn't your uh, favourite kind of thing, then um, there'll be 50% less drum on the 7th of April because sadly I can't make that game. But do get down to the AGL. It's, it's, it's the same team trying to play the you know the same football, obviously different surroundings. Felix are great hosts. And what's not to like about going to Felix though? I'm sure, to I'm, sure drum, I'm sure drum number two will more than make up for it. It will. It will. Um, 
Andreas um, stuck this in early, Joe, and I thought because you prepped for this, um, why not chuck you uh, in front of Andreas and everyone on the, watching? Uh, too bad that Ben isn't on the panel tonight, as I have questions about Jamie Ipswich and why he thinks the playoffs are a lottery. Um, but Ben has also done a clip uh, on a Leicester podcast today that someone else has mentioned um, about, uh, well, Leicester was involved in Leicester fans, wasn't he? Do you want to talk to us about this FFP situation with Leicester and, uh, yeah, try and navigate through this? Because I guess in terms of the promotion race, this could this could be really important, couldn't it? Yeah, well, if if if, if you look at it just on the sort of bare facts of it at the moment, where when you, when you look in the Premier League and you see what's happened to Nottingham Forest and Everton, where they've had points deductions for breaking the PRS requirements of profit and sustainability requirements they affect Leicester have effectively broken those rules at the same time so if if they were in the Premier League this season they would be getting a points deduction or they'd they'd been in the same process as especially Forest where they've had seasons at both levels but here's the big but which is saving them at the moment that the the Premier League agreed all the clubs agreed that it, each team would file their accounts by sort of the 1st of January and all punishments for um, breaking the rules would be applied in this season. So they would be there. But Leicester would be relegated and the EFL and the, and the Premier League haven't got the same rules together. So there's nothing from the Premier League rules. So where everyone's agreed you've got to get it in by January and we'll deal with it this season. The EFL is still saying you've got to get it in by March. We'll deal with it when we deal with it. So Leicester are, have effectively made a statement to say they are playing by the rules that they were given, even though they've flouted the rules last season. They've, they're not they're not putting their accounts in yet this season. They're putting them in late and they are, they're not going to get a points deduction this season. This, it's just not going to happen. They, if they get promoted, they will get one in the Premier League next season. Yeah. They've broken the rules. <coughs> there, there may be a way that the EFL and the Premier League get together to give them one in the EFL this season. But it's it's just a bit of a joke, really, isn't it? That you can, if they're in one league, they'd be getting punished because they're not. They're not. And the EFL has obviously had a number of issues with this over the past, like the way Derby, how they went with FFP, which resulted in, I don't know whether it's Mel Morris himself or Derby getting sued by Middlesbrough and Wickham. And I think they lost mm. court cases on that with mm. regards to and that. And yeah, we're in a position where effectively Leicester have sort of, flouted the rules last year, broken the rules and are not, not going to get punished for it this season. And they can still, and they're, and I'm sure they're breaking the rules again this season with the, with the EFL, FFP calculations, but there's, there's nothing that can be done about it and they can get promoted and they can be getting a 200 million pound reward for. It's bureaucracy that's like, failed, isn't it really? I mean, yeah, like, that's yeah. Oh, it is playing the system, aren't they? They're, they're coming out fighting with it, but, Ultimately, they, they they know that they're sort of there's a they're falling between two horses or falling yeah between two stools here. It's a grey area, isn't it, that they're exploiting? Driving a tank through that <laughs> that area that they've <laughs> that they've been given, but yeah. ultimately you've you've got you've got to do what you've got to do, don't you? There's no. I'm sure they've got legal advice and they they know they're on the right side of it. They will keep going, but it's it's very frustrating for us. But you look at the Premier League, the teams that finished last year. Sort of 16th, 17th place, Nottingham Forest, Leicester, oh, Nottingham Forest and Everton, who both were breaking the rules. Leicester got relegated, who were breaking the rules. And Leeds and Southampton must feel even more aggrieved that they were relegated when they when they had teams in that league who were effectively were breaking the rules. But I don't know. FFP, P, PNS, there's a lot of criticism. There's a lot of things it's trying to do. I do have sympathy as as a fan for Everton fans, Forest fans, Leicester fans, because ultimately they're spending money that they had. They just were spending too much. The way the calendars fell, maybe fell out with there, but it's it's very much protectionism from the big clubs and the leagues to try and do themselves. Leicester had four or five brilliant seasons, had a couple of bad summers, a couple of bad transfer windows, end up relegated. And then it could almost be if the rules were applied to the letter of the law straight down, it could be something that just kills the club when they've invested so much and continue to do so. And they've had good owners who have done that. So to sort of play devil's advocate on both sides of it, it, it is, I, I'm not, I'm not one that really wants to see big points deduction for fines. No. I think it's something that needs to try and be managed in real time with business plans yeah. and, and the like. 
Yeah. For, Forrest were the ones that got me really because it was all really it was a Brennan Johnson transfer and that was all down to timing. Really, it's wasn't hypothetical. It? Yeah, yeah, yeah hard one. I mean, Le- Leicester. You're talking about. I think I read earlier something like in the year up to 2022, lost ninety odd million, ninety odd million. And I think the rule is Joe would know this is something like a hundred million or a hundred and odd million over three seasons. I think it's a hundred and five million over three seasons. seasons. I mean. <sighs> Yeah, but they, you know, obviously they, as you're right, they're caught between the EFL and the, the Premier League and the EFL stools, aren't they? So they're obviously going to, I think, they're appealing. Obviously, two appeals on both on both fronts. So yeah, that's that's just going to run. And it's, and it's interesting. It's in not going to happen this season, is it? No, no, it, it can't happen this season, no. so it won't. But no. they they are now under an embargo from the EFL. But mm. when you look at our accounts, we have specifically put in there what our FFP calculations are, which is interesting. I've not seen that in any other teams' accounts. So. Mm. We are showing exactly what we've spent on the sort of non-football activities, investment into the ground, the women's team, the youth academy, the things that don't, the things that don't count against it. But we, um, yeah, well, we like I say, we lost eighteen million pounds getting promoted from League One last season. So the finances in football are crazy, and the rules are a little bit. I don't know. You just got to try and get things looking right when the music stops at your end of your financial years, don't you? Well, and this is it. I mean, I didn't realise that, again, I read this earlier, that Leicester played something like a £3.5 million pound fine um, going back to their, in 2000, this is 2018, I think they paid it, going back to their, when they won their, when they came out of the championship in 2013. So five years. Um, yeah. yeah, it's, uh, yeah, I mean, you, you look, I, I mean, it'll be interesting to see what happens in the Premier League this season with, with the points deduction so far and where they all, yeah, obviously yeah. where they all, where they all finish. But I mean, um, and, and it's, it's funny with, like you were saying about how it affects them mentally. Is it, is this going to be the thing that inspires them to, well, yeah, against adverse, the yes, odds. everyone's against, against us, all that. Yeah. yeah, this could work very much as, uh, yeah, very much us against the us against them siege mentality. Uh, Zorak yeah. also asked Leeds, Ipswich, and Southampton should protest or something. He's, there's a naughty word that I didn't see there, so I'll probably just put it on the screen. Um, maybe that's the, I don't know, Bright Path might have that strategic expertise in their wheelhouse. And they, maybe the capital's going to go on some lawyers. It's funny when you go back again, football just repeats itself. When we got relegated from the Premier League, we were relegated at the same time as Leicester. There's a couple of comments in there from mm. sort of Lee Cruncher about the, less, the administration. We went into administration where we tried to pay off and we and we did we did stitch up local businesses and St John's Ambulance and the like and it's sort of a sad day in the club's history when it did that but we tried to go into administration properly and yep. pay the 10-15% where Leicester just totally shut the shut it down started a new company in the same name paid nothing to nobody and then came out of it in a much better position than we did because we had these agreements that we had to meet to sell players and they went straight back up to the Premier League where we are still waiting 20 odd years later. So yeah. Yeah. funny yeah. that it's the same two clubs, isn't it? Yeah. Yep. Football's got nice symmetries like that, hasn't it? Um, let me see if I can try and find something related. I mean, let's talk about money. I think you might have mentioned this one already, Joe, but HCH talks about the Bright Path investment up to 105. Doesn't sound guaranteed, he says. Your thoughts? Are we getting a lot? Um, do we know much well, about that? It's, well, it's they, they they have said this money will sort of capitalise the club for four to five years. So okay. if you think we lost eighteen million pounds last year, that is eighteen million pounds of money that needs to be found. And in, I don't think these losses are going to be going down in the championship. So we need about twenty billion pounds a year just to mm. run effectively. So there is it is it does seem that that is all the money that we will need if 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 what they say is 105 million is being bought in for this four to five years of capitalization in that then yeah it, that probably is going to be all there but it's just i guess it's just how that valuation works do we need to get promoted is there a time scale in that to be promoted to get the full whack yeah. of it or does it there but these are commercial details that we someone might some secret squirrel might be able to find out looking through company's house and and the like but not the telegram <laughs> um Reading Tractor asks, I assume the maths is right here. Apologies if I'm wrong um, on behalf of Reading Tractor. If we're now worth 256 million, I think that's the kind of situation with the monies that have been spent yeah, to fund uh, uh, it, both the takeover and now the investment by Bright Path. Where does that put us in terms of clubs in England? Surely that must be easily in the top 20. I mean, it's interesting, Dave, isn't it? From an ORG perspective, you want kind of, I, I think Ed Schwartz says they're not taking money out at the moment as ORG, but you essentially, the value of their estimate has gone from 40 million, 40 to, million. to whatever, <laughs> if it is 256, I suppose, Reading Tractor. I mean, that 
even if you're not taking dividends or what have you, knowing that you've got an asset that was worth 40 million quid is now worth, you know, it's kind of comforting. That. It's comforting, isn't it? Yeah, it really is. Hopefully yeah. the Arizona Pension Fund takes, uh, you know, appreciates that. But in terms of that, you know, the, the thought that Reading Tractor has there, I mean, even more generally with, without quoting figures, that valuation does is, is really significant in terms of the stature of the club, isn't it? Yeah, I mean that's a you'd think that's a Premier League valuation, isn't it? Well, certainly lower lower half Premier League valuation, Joe. I would imagine so. Yeah, must be. Yeah, mm. yeah, yeah. I'd, I'd say so on that. It's it's just is that what we are actually valued at the moment without knowing the full ins and outs of the yeah, deal? Yeah, of course. Yeah, then, up to one hundred and five. There's potential. Then we don't know. Well. Yeah, but yeah. But these are basically these American investors are so keen on English football because the cost of business in America is so high. If you, if you want yeah. an MLS club, you're literally talking no. a billion pounds to yeah. get an MLS club. And even the USL, which is a division where, like I say, I, I know we've seen like Phoenix rising as they're linked with the owners. And I've watched a bit of Detroit because Ben Morris went there and these other teams there. And you're, you're talking like, you're paying like 20 million just to get a sort of a franchise like opening, just an expansion opening. That's like 20 million quid, then you've got to build a stage, and then you've got to do all this for what? Like a little two bit league in America with 1,500 people watching the games. Like, I mean, that it's not like you're buying a team for the MLS. Yeah, it's not you're, got the you're, international you're, audience, is it? Yeah, and all that. No, where if you put that, you know what I mean, if, if you have 20 million to spend and you and you put that money into Forest Green or Colchester or something like that, that 20 million can turn you into a championship club easily, really, couldn't it? There, mm. so it is a there's, there's a lot of um. There's a, there's a lot more value in English sport, in, mm. especially in English football, than there is in American football or American soccer as it is over there. Because I'd say these USL does not have many eyeballs on it. It does not have many fans there. It's almost hard to see how that survives longer term unless it can get a proper link up with the MLS. So you're you're paying to try and get a link up with a league that probably doesn't want you to link up to it. We're here you get into the pyramid system, which is linked up to it. And maybe they might not want you to be linked up to it, but but it is. It's, uh, if you were to stick, pump 20 million pounds into Colchester United, by the way, that I mean, that maybe fixes the pitch, perhaps. I don't know, but uh, <laughs> that, that's, that's my brother-in-law, got, that one. You've you got to ask um, how much they invested in the Halifax Mooseheads, or whatever it was. And the Mooseheads is a great name, isn't it? Steve, I mean, again, um, there's going to be different um, feelings and thoughts around this one. Steve, why do um, hard-headed, his, in quotes, businessmen from the States seem also nice? Um, I mean, that's that's kind of the American way, isn't it, guys? I mean, it you, is. You deal with Americans in your line of work, Dave? I certainly do. I certainly have done and certainly very still happy, do. happy, jovial people, aren't they? they Everything really, can they, get done. They, they really are. The, the vast majority of them are absolutely, as described there, all very nice. Yeah. And um, love, obviously, love coming over here. But as much as we... They, they, they smile while they shake your hand as they're taking your wallet out of your pocket. Absolutely. <laughs> well... Nonsense, I keep, I keep Nonsense. buying shirts in the sale, so it's working, <laughs> isn't it? And I guess, you know, it's, we've, we've kind of talked about um, Mike O'Leary staying involved. Um, Ed Schwartz, I think we've got a lot of time for Ed Schwartz. The three lines as well still involved as well. I guess mm-hmm. that gives a little bit of comfort, doesn't it, Dave? These are people that we now know and, yeah, and, and trust, I think, don't we? Did I see that they're oh, also, the three didn't lines and also up their investment also, yeah. I think, are read as well. So, yeah, that's that's all good from a continuity point of view, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, Charlie asks, how long does a state of the art training center take Ooh. to build? Any idea? Well, Joe, come on, Joe. Aren't, Le- aren't Leicester doing the same thing? Aren't they building the, the, a state they, of the They've center? done theirs. Theirs is incredible. It's probably one Norwich, of the best in Europe. Done one as well. Norwich done theirs. Yeah, they did theirs a few a few years back, didn't they? But yeah, I think from what Mark Ashton has said, he wants to start breaking ground effectively as soon as the planning is confirmed. And I think the planning is either in or close to being in. So you'd think you'd want to get it done mostly by this time next year. It's a, it's a very different project when you are building a new training ground at a new site. You've got to get all the pictures done as part of that. But this is just infrastructure. This is just building effectively. So, yeah, assuming you can get a decent build, I, I know a couple around the area. But... <laughs> I was going to say, Joe, you're going to get your tender in in the morning. I mean, you're around yeah, the corner, but... Joe. You should be you're sticking know, there, be yeah, posting yeah. it. Joe will be post, the... posting it through the letterbox. Stick some adverts on the back of the fence, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but 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 when but when you're there, it is only you're effectively building a building, aren't you? You're not you're not having to lay pitches, do all the drainage, run all that around there, which turns into a turns a big project into an absolute monster project. Site, get the new site, get roads to it, get all the infrastructure to it. So it should it should be if they if they start it this year, you'd hope it's sort of mostly in place or 
the main parts of it will be in place for the sort of start of the season it. after next. I can see it like light aircraft with a banner flying over Rushmere Golf Course <laughs> over Playford Road, doing a circle. There you go. Yeah, uh, yeah, Joe's. If if yeah, uh, no, follow Joe on internet. You'll figure out all of that kind of stuff out very quickly. <laughs> we're in the home straight. We're gonna we've got more questions. We're gonna deal with as many as we can. But I need to do do need to do some bits and pieces of business on behalf of the podcast as well as Joe's company too. Uh, we are brought to you in partnership with Innovation Labs. Go them uh, check them out. Nord as well. Do um, have a listen to Nick Ames' interview, which was. Uh, Unfortunate timing in respect of being maybe a week late. If, if we'd got his views on the on the um, the new investment, that would have been even better. But Nick is a resident member of our Telegram group, does check in from time to time, has given an early take on it as well. Um, but yeah, watch back our interview with Nick, giving his take on the promotion race, um, the wider game. He's the European sports correspondent for The Guardian. Um, really interesting views on, on the leagues and answered a few questions there. So uh, do check that out. Um, pre-match is back. We are back in the normal routine, albeit we're kind of a day backwards because we play on Friday, pre-match live, 8 p.m. Wednesday. Seb and I are talking about Blackburn. Ben and I, I think Ben's lingering in the chat, um, are doing a live watch along with the Blackburn game, half five kickoff. So do join us live for that. And then we'll be back here Sunday, 8 p.m. as always, going back over Blackburn, but also focusing on a big game against Southampton on Easter Monday. So check that out on Sunday. Merch store currently has a free delivery. So get yourself a hoodie. Um, and we mentioned the Telegram group about a million times. So do head over there. Lots of you here tonight. Um, obviously, there's there's nothing on the telly. Um, so great to see so many people here. Do give us a thumbs up and do subscribe as well. Plenty of content. We'll probably do some April predictions at some point as well. And we are in the run-in, essentially. I think we've officially confirmed the run has already started. So it's going to get serious now, folks. Uh, so get subscribed um, and get involved. And we'd love to hear from you as well. Uh, let's get back to the chat. And um, I think I think Dave Norman's trying to uh, cut into the point of what I think most town fans want to see maybe as a perk of the take of the investment. Uh, does this investment mean our chances of holding on to McKenna has significantly, his word, increased irrespective of what happens at the end of the season. Yeah, I'd want to say, I don't think it's decreased it, has it? It's certainly, mm. um, I think it's probably has strengthened that, has strengthened that somewhat. But um, yeah, as, as we say, as, as he's, you know, en- ended up there, I think a lot will depend on what happens um, in these next eight, nine, eight, eight games, nine games. Yeah, a lot, will, a lot will depend on that. Nick's views are quite interesting on that as well. So I do listen to Nick's perspective. Yeah. Not only is Nick... Um, talk about how highly he rates him, talks about the interest from maybe the the level up as it is at the moment. Um, but his views are on that as well, worth hearing that too. Mm. A few people giving their thoughts on West Burns. Gutted, says Romeo, big time, a big game player. And we have plenty of those coming up. Um, Simon compares, uh, Wes is a disaster, like Leeds losing Somerville or Southampton. Adams, is it? Is it? I guess it is, isn't it? Um, I mean, but the trouble is we've, we've maybe got used to Burns being out for a bit of time, haven't we, guys? Joe, I mean, it, it does look like it's a it's a it's Hutchinson or Jackson notionally playing out there, isn't it? So at least the choices of what McKenna has to do are pretty straightforward. Yeah, I've, I I I wouldn't like to say disaster because I don't think anything's a disaster at this stage of the season for us. But when you when you look at it in of these last eight games, Burns would have started six or seven of them, wouldn't he? He's a yeah, he he's is a your main man. Game. He starts and it's yeah. interesting, like Amari Hutchinson seems to have played a couple of times against Sheffield Wednesday and against Millwall in that Ted roll from Connor Chaplin. And it's been superb in both those games where he wasn't as effective maybe when he starts in that, in that right-hand side. I think he's really, really effective coming on on the right-hand side or starting in the middle. So there's probably a, I, it wouldn't be surprising if McKenna does try and jiggle things around a bit slightly there. Maybe there's other options, Caden Jackson, a couple of people in the chat have put Harry Clark as a potential right wing. Yeah. He's Al Hamadi, we've, maybe. We've seen him there before. Um, Amari, Marcus Harness could probably play on that side. Yeah. But so, something will happen. But yeah, no, it's a it's a massive blow losing Wes Burns because he is Mr. Dependable, big big game player, comes yeah. up the big moments and the big games for us and has done since he signed. Joe, I, I want think, to stay with well, gone, Dave. No, I think Joe's right. He had his start at every game. You know, yeah. if you remain fit, it has it started all these games. Without and that power. pace is a threat, as we know. As yeah, well. he's, just direct, he's just direct, isn't he? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And ironically, that's how he got the injury. <laughs> True. Uh, Carnival Nation's been very... Uh, he's been talking about oxygen a lot in the chat. Um, 
uh, QQQs, but three Qs to make sure his question gets asked. Joe, I'll come to you on this one. Uh, great, we are going for Cat 1. Uh, do you think we were, if we had already been Cat 1, we would have retained some of the youth players that are now at Man City, Arsenal, etc.? Um, you, you just don't know because there, there, there is a lot of transfers that go on between Cat 1 academies because these teams are still, are still trying to poach the best players. And ultimately, if you've got the best players, the best teams want them and you, you struggle to keep hold of them. But it, it's more that you can get people in sort of better players at a younger age and have them more for your system. And the, the longer you have them here, the better chance you've got of keeping them here because ultimately you can show them what they've got and try and set them pathways and go from there. But no, it's just, it just raises the standards required. Ultimately, we, if, like I say, if you get this and you're going into the under 18s on the 21s leagues, you need to be of a standard where you can compete with these teams. Cause at the moment, these teams are, hammer us every week if we, if we were playing Arsenal under 18s sort of week in week out we would be it would be sort of five six nil seven nil games because they are that good and we and our levels have suffered because of that so it, it's a real a real step up required and it's going to be a real tough job for sort of Gary Prober and the re- academy recruitment guys to get to get some good enough players in early doors to try and help us bridge the gap to it before you can bring your other ones through yeah, it does take a bit of time for bedding, doesn't it? Go on, Dave. Wasn't, wasn't there another rumour, I want to say a rumour, that we might be losing another one? So is it Rob Earnshaw? Rob Earnshaw's lad. Man United? Yeah, I, I think it's Sil- Sylvia Mexes. Yeah, that's, that's right. Yeah, not, yeah. Signed a couple of years ago, but it is, yeah, Rob Earnshaw's son. But I, I think they're based in like Shenfield, Brentwood, that sort of way. Oh, but okay. They, they're coming to Ipswich, but they're going to Manchester United. It's like, how, how can you compete when they're willing to move? Yeah, you can. As a family, are willing to move to yeah. the other side of the country effectively for their yeah. son's football and education and you can't so you can't you can't blame parents they want the best for their children and of course that's what they think is the best that's what they'll do but yeah this is the level you're talking now you're, you're not talking oh there's someone trying to move or norwich want to get in west ham want to get any any team in europe will try and get these boys yeah uh dave uh, we've kind of alluded to this paul says it's a long way from here to the cobbles isn't it oh, even yeah, marcus oh, evans can you so i uh, think how many people have now got at least a decision-making role at the club and rewind it back that three years when you basically had it was Marcus Evans and a few minions who were able to do a little bit. It was Marcus Evans and a few minions. And if you, if you go back to the Cobbolds, it was Bobby Robson. You you see, you know, ran the club from top to bottom um, with, you know, they, they weren't really weren't interested. Um, yeah, it's just this. You're right. It's come such well. It's it's a it is a um, parallel universe compared to the Cobbold era. But yeah, it's, it's come such a long way in the last three years since the Evans era. You're right. It was it seemed very um, uh, almost a dictatorship under Evans. Was it so we you know so we understand you know staff were leaving. It was run on an absolute shoestring, wasn't it? So uh, yeah, it's it's just much so so different now. And you can see, I guess we've made this point throughout, you can see why some people, particularly who've been around and, and experienced these kind of ownership changes, these regime changes, are a little bit apprehensive. Yeah, a lot more skeptical. people with skin in the game now, aren't they? And and again, yeah. I guess the, the ORG controlling stake is important. Mark, Mark Ashton having such an important role gives a little bit of that, you know, consistency of how things have happened because at the, nothing really should change in terms of business as usual when everyone comes into work tomorrow, really, should it? No, he shouldn't. I, I mean, I think it was just such a, you know, the club was was horrible, wasn't it? Three years ago under Evans, it was just a horrible, horrible place. So you know, any 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 takeover, anything. Yes, it was. I, I don't know at the time that people were treating it with scepticism. And Paul's comment there about the cobbles, you know, people were harp, not harping back, were were sort of you know alluding back to those days. Well, you know, that's just you know that's clearly never not sustainable in the football world we live in now. So certainly at the top of the pyramid. Yeah, yeah, absolutely not in the top. Yeah, absolutely not. So um, yeah, I think. Um, <laughs> these these three years, uh, well, yeah, these three years have been, yeah, perhaps a little bit roller coaster at times, sort of first year, eighteen months, but since then, just just been absolutely incredible, hasn't it? Yes. Uh, let's do let's do some random bits and pieces. I I need to get Joe's opinion on Castor and Umbro, but the way into that is from Jack's question here. Does anyone know when Ed Sheeran's sponsorship runs out? I think he's extended it for one more year, but I don't know if that was this year or it's next I think, year. I think it's just a rolling year-to-year sponsorship. Mm. Okay. Um, I wonder whether that might change and whether Bright Path or others might have things in mind there. But Ed is a great ambassador for the club, isn't he? Great to have him involved, so we could see that continue. What is going to continue for one more year, though, Joe, very quickly, is 
Umbro manufacturing our kit. But after that, there's a little bit of uncertainty with Castor buying it, buying the license rights. Do you want to give your? I gave my thoughts on the pre-match show, but do you want to give you a quick take on Castor and Umbro? Um, I've, I've liked what um, what we've had from Umbro so far. So it will be a shame if that relationship seems to be coming to an end because they've done it there. Personally, I felt the Adidas kits were better quality, but but we didn't have the design input into those, which maybe if we we would now, maybe we're in a position where we would, would maybe get a bit more out of them. But from Castor, I I say I know they had a bit of a disaster with the Aston Villa kit this year, one of the kits there. But I've I've got a couple of their kits just randomly from other bits, and I think it's all it's always been really good quality stuff, and I've and I've liked what I've seen from them. I've liked their designs, I've liked the quality, but it's it's expensive, like yeah. their training kits it's premium isn't it other bits are expensive and like the the kits like a rangers kit or a newcastle kit is like 75 pounds as opposed to 50 pound and i said i bought a villa kit recently for someone and it's, it's all it's all good quality the stuff but i just think they'd they, they got the home kit wrong badly wrong and it just did not it must have been the sort of technology and the science behind the actual kicks it just wasn't wicking away sweat and it looked like you'd had a bucket of water chucked on which i think the um ladies team were panicking about when they saw the men's yeah. in pre-season and i think they managed to get it changed yeah um we've got some revised maths running tractor says 2.6 2.5 million actually um and elliot reporting uh falls report in 22 23 the bournemouth were 20th in the prem valuation at uh that was euros i think 226 million euros so there you go. Exchange rates at least double stuff. what Bournemouth are worth. Oh, there, you go. Myself, coast. there you go. Uh, um, another random cue for, well, we'll put this to Joe because he was there last night, but both of you can answer this one. Um, uh, Leif Davis, better than Ben Chilwell? Ben Chilwell is a really good player, but he, he didn't have his best game last night, but <laughs> he's he a really, really good player. And if Leif Davis can have as good a career as Ben Chilwell, I think he'll be very happy. There you go. That's a very diplomatic answer. Yeah, I'd go with that. Uh, Trevor, also, we need to, we're talking about Wes Burns' injury, need to remember that Burns also misses out on the Euros if Wales qualify, so you're going to have to feel sorry for that as well. Yeah. Uh, we are an extra added time. We'll keep going as long as there are bits and pieces for us to talk about in the chat. Um, got a mention of Paul Cook here from Cruncher76. Um, congratulations to him getting Chesterfield back into the Football League. Moores Burns, Morsey Burns, Chaplin Burgess, he's crediting Walton, I guess, as well. We need to... Yeah. But there were some good, nice pictures on Instagram of Bailey Clements, Kieran Dyer, and yeah, Dobra, young Dobbs, yeah, good stuff. Yeah. Interesting sliding doors, isn't it? That kind of situation there, you know. Obviously, the Paul Cook era didn't last too long, did it? After that, but yeah, fair I play to him on the way out. <laughs> I'm sorry to bring that one up, Joe. Yeah, well, I'm trying to find a positive to end with. Um, anyone got anything? Positive. Apart from um, we have made it an hour in um, an hour and one minute. Thank you, everyone who's joining the chat and got your questions in. We mentioned uh, we'll be back for the pre-match show Wednesday. We might, you know, spring a surprise and stick something out maybe midweek as well. But I think probably Ben might have a live watch along for one of the international games. So worth doing that. Um, but thank you, everyone, for your questions. Um, normal service resumes at uh, the earlier day of Wednesday for the pre-match show, Friday for the live watch along for Blackburn, and then we are back here next Sunday, usual time, eight p.m. Dave, thank you, as always, for your uh, wisdom, Andrew, your company you. yesterday as well. Joe, yeah. drilling through the academy stuff and, and the pie charts and Telegram and all that kind of great stuff as well. So thank you. Um, uh, if you haven't given us a thumbs up and a subscribe, do that before you go um, and do so on your podcast app of choice. You can just press five stars and that means the world for us. Um, but thank you, everyone, for the nice words in the chat as well. And anyone going to Blackburn? Um, either of you guys? Off to Blackburn? Yeah, it should be, yeah. There you go. No, Friday. Dave. No, Good not Friday. Friday. No, well, we're going to have, yeah, we're going to talk about more ticket situation, I'm sure, with Coventry and, and others coming up in the uh, in April. But yeah, it's getting real now, isn't it, guys? Um, last international break is done. Um, proper football uh, back Wednesday. We've had a, a great show. Thank you, everyone, for getting involved. Um, and do see us over on Telegram. Have a great week. We will see you all soon. 